What I wanted to do, though, was just present a kind of work in progress. I haven't come with any answers or a neatly polished slide deck. This is the first time I've talked about this stuff. Um, so I want it to be a work in progress. I think it could be a bit of a provocation, perhaps. It's hopefully a conversation amongst you guys about what really works with you and what doesn't work. Uh, and also a plea for help from our point of view. We're after good ideas and a good way of making sense of our data. So it's kind of road testing a few things. So I guess my agenda is I'd love to present emerging findings from a three-year ethnographic study that we're doing in three high schools in Australia. That was my hidden agenda. Monica, I think, would really like to kind of unpack the whole connected learning agenda and ed tech agenda and try and mess messy it up a bit. And I guess our shared interest as a group is trying to make better sense of schools and tech and what happens when tech hits schools. Um, so if we can do all that, I'll be really, really pleased. Um, our project, and there's four of us on this project, so there's Scott Belfin, Nicola Johnson and Selena Nemerin. And the three of those are in three different high schools in Australia over a three-year period doing an ethnograph ethnographic study. And most ethnographic studies just involve hanging around, observing, participating, and just making sense of a setting. So that th the question is usually, what is going on here? Nothing more than that. So I guess if we have a research question for our project, it is just what is going on in Australian high schools with digital tech. So we didn't go in with any particular agenda. We didn't go in to find the sexy technology or the cool stuff. We just went in and just let technology kind of find us. So we tried to ask people, you know, what's going on, what's, what's taking place? And then we've just sort of followed the money in a way. So this isn't a best practice, leading edge. When I said leading edge at one conference, someone said, no, no, it's bleeding edge now in tech. So whichever way you want to look at it, this isn't the, the really, really cool stuff. We've taken a very contrary approach. So this is a really old school piece of research, so a kind of institutional ethnography or a piece of classroom research. We've not hung out in bedrooms or street corners or um, uh, homes. We haven't got much to say about the stuff that goes on outside of the school. And we deliberately chose that approach because there's so much good work that's been taking place on all of that. I mean, Dana's stuff and the stuff that's taken place with Mimi Ito. And a lot of you guys have been involved in some really cool work about young people and technology. We're interested in schools and technology, and actually, as Monica said, students and technology, which is a very different thing than young people. So hopefully we can merge our research in with the existing uh, literature that's out there on young people and tech and begin to try and make sense about how we could put things forward. So hopefully there's stuff here that will resonate. There might be stuff here that doesn't work for you. I think the three responses I was really hoping you can give me is either yes, that bit really rings true, and what's more, I know about this, so that gives us a great idea, or no, this doesn't ring true at all in our schools, and also, why? Or maybe a third response is you haven't thought this through at all, the real issues are Z. So if you can give us any of those responses, we'll be really happy. But I'm happy for it to spark off any conversations you want. If I say something which tangentially relates to a really big issue that you're interested in, then let's go for that, because um, I'm not entirely sure what our findings are. Just before we start, I want to just present three stories or three areas which are emerging from our research and then what I think the implications are for understanding education and schools. Just before we start, though, I'd just like to say these are not basket case schools. We didn't pick schools we thought were deliberately bad or deliberately good. We tried to pick what um, Stephen Balls calls ordinary schools. And we can unpack what ordinary means. I mean, no school is ordinary, but these are not schools that are doing particularly badly or particularly well. They're doing okay. Um, but they also are digital schools. These schools have got technology dripping all over them. They're infused with personal devices that students and teachers are bringing in. They're also hidebound by big, complicated um, platforms and structures, learning management systems, management information systems. There's all sorts of technology uh, at the back end. Um, nearly all the staff get the idea for technology. This isn't the case that there's a whole bunch of dinosaurs that you know, we'll never understand. These are all... A lot of these teachers are digital natives, if you take the original kind of Prensky definition, in as much as they're in their 20s and 30s. Um, and everyone's doing fine. So in the big scheme of things, to use a kind of Australian idiom, there's no, no worries at all. These schools are okay. But of course, it's not quite as simple as that. Even though these schools are doing okay on paper, there's a lot of complexity about the way that technology is being used. And in particular, how it fits with what we think technology could be used for, particularly the connected learning agenda, but the, in Europe, the technology-enhanced learning agenda, all of these kind of ed tech discourses are perhaps less apparent and less evident in the schools that we're looking at. So we have got heaps of data. Uh, it's very nice of Monica to say that this was solid evidence, but I can't present a three-year ethno three ethnography in uh, 20 minutes. It's not going to happen. So I've got some very kind of just um, 
quick go through some of the, the three things that we, we think might be of interest. So I wanted to talk about bring your own device, which is what's going on in schools. I wanted to talk um, secondly about making and maker technologies. Those are now hitting these schools. And thirdly, personalized learning and apps and how those things are hitting the classroom. There's other stuff I could talk about, but um, those are three nice things to think about. Bring your own device, one-to-one -one laptops. I'm sure you've kind of, you're up to speed with the whole idea about this, but the idea that students can bring in their personal devices and teachers can bring in their personal devices and everyone has a device, great things happen. And schools, all the schools that we were working in had a bring your own device or one-to-one -one policy. And actually they had a whole range. One of them was, and I should say we had urban, rural, we had kind of mid SES to low mid to SES. We had a mixture of schools. Um, one of them had a managed bring your own device program, which was heavily controlled by a private company that was running the tech. School uh, teachers could, and students could lease a laptop. That had to be a Dell laptop, or they could buy a Dell laptop, and then they brought the Bell Dell laptop in. Uh, the other school had an iPad program, bring your own iPad or lease an iPad. Actually, the schools were also loaning iPads, which was interesting. And the third school had a very free, permissive, bring what you want, knock yourselves out type policy, which is interesting. There's a whole range of tech in these schools that students are bringing in. And we did see some quite cool stuff. We saw technology devices all over classrooms. We saw kids bringing in their stuff. And on occasion, we observed and participated in a few good or even excellent bring your own device classrooms. These were lessons that seamlessly flowed. The teachers had planned stuff and orchestrated stuff where work took place and students work went off into groups and maybe collaborated and did their own research. Often they would have a couple of students that would fire shoot any technical problems. That seemed to be one way that bring your own device managed to work. And the, and the, the teachers often backed off and were just kind of conducting things. And we did see a few of those lessons, but we didn't see very many we saw a few instances of kids actually spinning off into their own connected learning wonderlands, you know, behind the scenes researching something that they weren't meant to be researching and uh, Mimi Ito's geeking out. There was evidence of that. Kids didn't normally talk about it, but you could see it happening occasionally in classrooms. On the most part, though, we saw very kind of bog standard lessons taking place with devices. Usually students were very rarely let loose with their devices. Bring your own device for the most part, was based around a very common task, a very prescribed set of work, and teachers kind of struggling to get their students to do the same thing with their devices at the same time. And it was often channeled through a, a very walled garden approach, either the learning management system or everyone using the same app. So the main practice I think that we saw was bring your own device is really a way of getting kids through the same set work that had been set, all finishing at roughly the same time, doing roughly the same thing. And the main benefit is that the teacher, teachers seem to be able to let kids that weren't struggling or were actually doing quite well just to work independently. And it soon became very clear the students that needed extra help. So it was a really good way for teachers to differentiate their attention and work with students that were struggling. Others could just get on with it. But the main practice was that. It wasn't anything better than that. So I guess the benefits of bringing your own device was that classes progressed a little more smoothly, but that would be mainly it. The second main practice that Bring Your Own Device was allowing people to do in schools was it was allowing students to work very much as people work in offices with, with technology. They were getting on with their set task, but they could also multi-screen. So a lot of kids brought in second devices and would second screen, sometimes for related stuff, dictionaries, translation, uh, Wikipedia, YouTube, you know, other information sources but often just to check their personal social media, check their Facebook, um, you know, to kind of do the stuff that we all do, um, to flip between screens. And so in that respect, bring your own device was working as well. But it wasn't necessarily leading to individualization or differentialization. Everyone was kind of doing the same thing. And one of the things that we noticed about um, the lessons with bring your own devices, there was now a a, quite a common rhythm to teaching with a, with a device full classroom. The first five minutes is very much built around firefighting, trying to make sure everyone either switches their devices on and gets them out or puts them away and, and turns them off. So when you're observing lessons, there are these now mantras. You used to say, right, sit down and shut up. That was my school I went to in Britain. But now it's very much lids down, phones on the table, devices off, earbuds out. And there was this kind of five minutes of, of uh, kind of wrangling technologies. Um, and, and, and in that respect, the devices in the classrooms are very niggly. 
the teachers would often complain that learning didn't take place or it was all very submerged and it was all very logistical and the management seemed to be a big issue. A lot of these niggles came from the massive disparity in devices. Device, we always say device and think it's some homogenous thing, a huge disparity of devices. So we had kids bringing in the, the worst low quality smartphones that had cracked screens and the keyboards didn't work and they were struggling away to try and do this work. And on the other hand, you had the kids with the iPhone 6 or the iMacs and all, all sorts of stuff. There was a huge range of, and that was a huge problem for the teachers because it made th the place very, very plodding if everyone didn't really have the same device. One of the other interesting things that we found about bringing your own device was the, the school's default response is to try and regulate. So you've got these devices coming in. What was really interesting was that were the rules and regulations that had grown up around it. And there were a host of draconian rules in these schools. So one school didn't allow kids to bring in any cables. They didn't allow the kids to bring in any smartphones. This is the school with the iPads. One of the schools had rules about how you handled your device. You always have to have two hands on it at any time. It has to be in a particular case. And there were all sorts of rules and regulations that othered the device. All of a sudden, it wasn't the, the kid's own device. It was kind of a school thing. What was really fascinating was how actually the, the teachers uh, and the kids negotiated very quickly ways around this. And it was really interesting to see how the, the kind of crazier, more top-down rules very, very quickly were kind of uh, ebbed away as people negotiated a working relationship with these things. That was a really pleasing thing. It wasn't that schools were so rigid they wouldn't allow kids to do what they did. So there's just to and fro of shaping device use. One of the really interesting things was earbuds. Earbuds are huge in Australian schools. I don't know if they are here. Kids plugging in into their devices to listen to music. Now this is one of the kind of 21st century office working practices I was referring to. A lot of the classes, when the kids were left to do their own, their own work, they would say, oh, can we just listen to music while we work? And most of the time they were allowed to do that. And earbuds are this big kind of contentious uh, thing in schools now. And it was really interesting how teachers and students negotiated this. There were some teachers that said, absolutely no way are you listening to any music in my class. If you're listening to music, I, you're not listening to me. Other teachers were, were very, very fine with it. And actually, there were a few classes where teachers would play music anyway, which was a really interesting thing because it was part of their own way of doing stuff as well. So the way that these school rules were sort of negotiated was really, really interesting. One of the interesting uh, pressure points in all schools is power, charging these things up. There's a huge political economy of power in schools, and I mean it by electricity. So as I say, in some schools, you weren't allowed to have any charging. You cannot charge your device in school. And the schools, school leaders were saying, how on earth are we going to pay for hundreds of kids charging their devices up every day? Our power bill is enough as it is. Some classes, teachers would actually kind of renege, and you'd have these kind of workaround practices where they'd kind of tape millions of extension cords to the floor and kids could occasionally plug in, but it became this real sort of battleground, these kind of power plays haha, between the school administration, the teachers and the students. What was really interesting was, this was last month, we've gone back in for the last uh, six months of one of the schools, they've started to put in PowerPoints for the, for the kids to use. But they've done it in a really interesting way. These are crappy photographs because we were being taken around by the principal on a guided tour, so we were snapping them as... Uh, uh, as we went around. So they put 20 PowerPoints in the, in the classrooms, right underneath the whiteboard, the teacher's smart board. When we initially saw that, we thought, That's, what a cr why have they done that? How are the kids going to access it? But it's fairly obvious why they've done that, because the teacher has the control over the power. You cannot plug into those PowerPoints unless the teacher sees you and lets you do it. There's no way the kids can surreptitiously be kind of getting the juice off. And now this is a math classroom, and the PowerPoints have been put in the ceiling. So it's not, a, it's not a wood shop, it's a math classroom. So if you want to plug in, you have to stand up and plug your device in. Now, it's a fascinating way that technology is being shown. Langdon Winner wrote about um, scythes, I think, in the 19th century. And he was saying the scythe handles were very small, so the workers were always down like this. If anyone stood up, you knew that they were doing something wrong. So if anyone stands up here to plug in their device, really interesting thing. So it's a kind of ethnographic um, black hole to go down, but I think it's a kind of interesting... Um, way of thinking about the way that schools and, and students are working things out. Lots of other things that were being negotiated. Ta the social obligation of taking phone calls from your parents and texts from your parents, that was a big issue. And schools weren't happy to try and regulate that. So there was a very uneasy tension around that. Um, and just the whole technical frustration. We, we, we haven't necessarily focused on teachers and kids. We're quite happy to talk to people that work in the canteen, that work in tech support, that work on the, the administrators, that work on the desk. The technicians are just doing their heads about bringing your own device. They don't know where the line is, whether they're meant to fix a kid's iPhone 6 and their problems with Verizon, or whether they're just meant to work on school devices, and it's just this mess. 
And it's a mess that's not really being sorted out. Um, but it's going to become a bigger and bigger issue. So I guess in many ways, bring your own device is nothing special. It's allowing schools to carry on as they are. It's allowing students and teachers to kind of work in a slightly more modern way, but it's no more free. It's still a very controlled, regulated way of working. Um, and it's m much more of an instruction than an invitation. When I first heard about bring your own device, oh, that's really nice, yeah, bring your own device. It's not like that, it's, it's bring your own device and then we'll tell you what to do with it. So this idea of it being an instruction <laughs> rather than an invitation is a really nice way of thinking about the way that it's, it's hit school. I'll rush through the other two because, um, uh, oh no, that's the other thing I was going to say is about resistance. We've, we, were, we were hoping the kids would be doing all sorts of stuff with the, with the, um, the networks. They've got their own devices, it's going to be really interesting. It wasn't at all. The kids are just very, very happy to just sit there, play games, watch videos on YouTube, just kind of withdraw from the classroom. There's very little active resistance. There's a kind of click of kids that try and get proxies and VPNs in and try and get around the school firewall. But otherwise, there's very, very little stuff. And where it is, it's the usual kid stuff. This is a guy, a, a young lad who was Jewish and thought that the school didn't really understand his heritage. So he had a Hebrew looking um, wallpaper thing. We were interested in it because it had Spotify and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then we realized what he'd done. And it was like, yeah, well done, mate. But he'd had this up for a couple of years and no one had really noticed. But there was little things like that. So it's an interesting space. Yeah, it's for teachers that looking around and saying, what are you doing, mate? And then, oh, right. Presumably no one had ever done that because I'm sure he would have got a rocket up his ass for doing it. But still, less of that than you'd hoped for, I guess. Coming from a youth research point of view, you'd hope that everyone was doing that. But anyway. I'll move on. I'm f I was, we were so stoked about making technology. So making te maker technologies were the new things in the school. Everyone's talking about make 3D printers, uh, e-textiles, paper circuitry. And there's a big kind of hype in the ed tech uh, area about this, you know, making and blah, blah, blah. What was interesting is how it's hitting the schools and being kind of subsumed into design and technology and classroom thinking. And it's the same story, I guess, as bring your own device great expectations and then um, slightly more prosaic uh, use of the technology. We participated in a few of these lessons. In fact, Selena took part in a whole year nine uh, design your own racing car type thing for 12 weeks and she made her own racing car um, and lost the race. But even just taking part in these lessons, it was fascinating how, first of all, they were completely controlled and orchestrated and micromanaged by the teacher. The teacher had to be in control of these things, even in terms of using the 3D printers. And the schools proudly show you these 3D printers when you go on open evening. You know, we've got 3D printers. When you use them in the class, they're in a box. This is completely in a, a handmade box with a perspex screen. So you can never touch it because obviously it's health and safety. It's quite a hot thing. You could burn yourself. How are you going to print out 24 kids' work on this over a 12-week period? The teacher printed everything out himself. T kids would email designs and he'd print them out overnight and then they would magically appear. So already you're distanced from the making process. So the students weren't makers. The classroom definitely wasn't a making space. It was very, very led by the teacher. One of the other interesting things that about maker culture, I don't know if you're, you're particularly into the particular area, but it's this idea of open source and there are all sorts of designs that you can share in, you know, is it Thingiverse? And there are all sorts of ways of you take designs and you tweak them. None of that, because it's a school, it has to be individual work. You cannot work with anybody else. You cannot collaborate with anybody else. So the teachers would say, I know if they've been using code from the web, because I can tell it's much better than <laughs> they do themselves. There was a complete ban on working with anybody or using previous codes. The whole making ethos was just being kind of stripped away by assessment concerns or curriculum concerns or time concerns or space concerns. None of this could take place outside of the classroom, for example. The other interesting thing about actually doing an autoethnography about making lessons is how utterly dull they are. Selena and all the class, well not all the class, but most of the class soon found it really, really boring. They weren't allowed near any software or any technology until they'd got a printable design done. And this was all done on paper and worksheets and rulers and pencils for about four or five weeks. And then they were allowed to go on SketchUp, which I guess some of you may know is a very low level clunky Google, I think, uh, CAD design package, which doesn't quite get things accurate enough to be printed out. So there were these really frustrating lessons and weeks where you, kids would do something, print it out, and it did. eventually kids and Selena were just filing things off, smashing them with hammers, and just trying to do it by hand because that was just the way to do it. So 
It was a very successful project. They all made their cars. This was Selena's car. She's 42, I think. Um, she was pretty much into the, the glitter and the, so she really kind of uh, pimped it up, as she put it. Uh, some of the kids made much better ones that went properly. Her, her engine broke down. And it looks like a really fun thing. It looks like new tech, but it was actually a really, really kind of prescribed, regimented, very kind of dull project. And a lot of the kids at the end just said, this is, yeah. This isn't good. We're not going to pick one of these lessons again. And so I, I guess the, the Larry Cube and um, computer meets classroom, classroom wins. 3D printers meet classroom, classroom wins. But I mean, what else could the teacher do? And we had a lot of um, time with the teacher. He has a curriculum. He has a set timetable. He has to get these kids. I'm not sure how else it could be done. Anyway. The last thing, and I'll, I'll rush through this actually because I'd rather want to talk about the bigger picture, um, just the apps that were coming into the classrooms. The, the, te the software and applications in schools, the learning management system is the mothership. It just structures everything. Every school, everything goes through the learning management system. You, you can't get away from that. I might talk about LMSs later. But that's what school tech is mainly about. Most of the work goes through the LMS. Everything gets uploaded there. Every, yeah, that's, that's it. What was interesting was that teachers were bringing in apps to try and work around things. And every teacher was doing something different. Lots of them weren't bringing in apps, but a lot of them were bringing in stuff that you might be familiar with. Um, Duolingo, for example, uh, Class Dojo, um, Poll Anywhere, Quizlet, Nearpod, Office Mix, which isn't really an app, but you know what I mean. Um, and they were bringing these things in to just try and do things around the, around the learning management system. Um, key motivations were making their life easier, and it was free. Now, it's not to say that teachers were dupes about data and privacy and all that stuff, but we were trying really interesting conversations with them about, well, you know, what are you paying for? Um, that, again, is being fudged. There's a lot of stuff that's being fudged around, so data and privacy and stuff is just taking place under the radar. What was interesting was that these were keen, clued-up teachers that were getting stuff from pr uh, personal learning networks, getting advice from Twitter and Facebook, maybe just going onto the App Store and going through the top 50 and... They were sort of, you know, they were, they were hunting out stuff they thought would work. But what was really interesting was the way these were being used in um, lessons and with, with students was very much in terms of, same with bring your own device, to control, to regiment, and to regulate. So these are all meant to be devices that, you know, provoke personal learning and allow kids to do this and do that. A lot of the apps were being used so the teachers could have more control. So we had a really interesting um, group of teachers using Nearpod. I'm not sure if you're, you're aware of it, but this kind of content sharing uh, idea that allows you to kind of just share things with kids and kids can go off and do stuff. And it gives you analytics. And um, it was being used mainly in classrooms to see what the kids were doing and to try and control what they were doing. And so because Nearpod gives a lot of analytics back, the teachers were using those analytics to actually then say, you're not doing your work properly, actually, you should be doing this. And so it was really interesting how what is seen to be kind of flexible and personalized from one point of view can quickly be used to be very kind of regimented and, and uh, mass in another point of view. And again, this was a big problem for teachers using these apps. One of the, the, the schools actually that was using Nearpod, how do you get give kids access to this app and then make sure they're all doing the same thing? So we had classes where the teacher would set the kids off on the app that he or she had picked and then project a huge clock counting down for 15 minutes. And he says, right, you all have to do the same thing. And at the end of it, one of you is going to come up and show me what you've done. So everyone just does the same thing for 15 minutes. Now, that's not personalized learning, is it? I don't think. Um, and that's not necessarily what the app could be used for. We had another teacher that would set homework on Nearpod and then stay up watching Nearpod all evening, watching his kids log in and do the homework, which is fascinating. A, why he was working nine o'clock at night watching kids do homework and B is that really what the app was for so what was interesting was the kids and the students didn't really mind this they would you know whatever you know use this polling thing to try and make sure that we do this what they didn't like necessarily was the the inconsistency of this and this came up with bring your own device as well students were very much about just make us do one thing and keep it regular stop trying to surprise us with stuff don't tell us you know all of a sudden we're going to use a new app or and I thought, oh, you can kind of see where they were coming from. Teachers that were introducing something like Schoolology, which is almost like a learning management system, alongside the learning management system that the students are already using, they were kind of saying, why are we using two learning management? It's like if your boss made you use three different types of word processor, depending on, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So really, really interesting that, again, very supply side, very teacher centered, and very much based around monitoring and regulation and control. 
So anyway, so what? This is the question I always ask about the research I do. As do lots of other people often saying, well, no, who knows? Um, I, in some ways, perhaps none of this, none of the stuff we're finding is any cause for alarm at all. I don't know what you would expect to happen in schools, apart from what we found. These schools have changed immensely. I started doing, Monica asked me when I started doing research in this area, 1995, 21 years ago. How dull is that? That's all I've done is this type of research. So you'd think I'd be better at it or coming up with some answers, but the schools have changed a lot since 1995. These are digital schools. These are schools with a huge amount of technology. The teachers are on board. It's, you know, this is kind of what we were hoping would happen in 1995, is now writ large. And they're all doing fine. And perhaps the long-term effects of these technologies are long-term. I don't know why you'd expect bringing your own device or 3D printers to really be making a huge change, but perhaps in five years' time, one of those 3D printing classes, the kid might spark off and who knows what might happen. It, same with bring your own device. Maybe in five, ten years' time, the effects are more subtle. So in some ways, no, no, no dramas. Another Australian phrase I've picked up. But I've got some emerging thoughts, I think, about problematizing four different areas of education which might be useful for the ways for, for thinking about this in, in, a, in a broader perspective. First of all, students. And the first thing I would like to stress is that young people and students are not the same thing. We've been studying students. They're young people working in the role of being a student. And when you work as a student, you have a very fixed set of priorities. So what's interesting is that these are not the cool, happy-go-lucky, you know, connected learners and uh, the, the cool ge geeking out people that we, we read about in some of the literature. These are students who just want to get on, or actually some of them just want to get by. But either way, they just want to do their job. So there are some kids who are very on message, that want to get good grades, that want to get through, and they just want to get through the whatever works. But they don't want to be involved with whatever doesn't work. So wasting their time with peripheral stuff that might seem cool, there's a lot of pushback against that. They want stuff that's just going to help them do the work, get the work in, get good grades, maybe progress and they'll use technology accordingly. There are other kids that are less educationally engaged that just want to get by, that often want to just zone out. So if they're allowed to plug in and listen to music on YouTube, they'll do that. But again, they're not really going to be fooled by the chocolate-covered broccoli. Oh, we've got a 3D printer. It's a boring piece of work. It, yeah. maths, I could talk to you about maths games for a long time, but kids are not very impressed with maths games. And so in that respect, I mean, school isn't really a place where students or actually teachers want to do anything particularly sexy or experimental or edgy. School is not a place to fail, fail fast or fail often. It's not a place to experiment. It's a place to kind of get good grades. Uh, and as I say, students want consistency. We surveyed all the students before we started, and what was really interesting was the majority of them didn't mind the rules. About 10% wanted more rules, and about 20% wanted less, fewer rules. Kids are quite happy being regulated. They just want to be knowing where they stand with school. And so, as I said, what we might see as flexibility, a lot of them see as a hassle. Schools are not, students are not young people. The tech is, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you could say about the tech, as I've kind of um, hinted at. There are hobbyist teachers that will bring in cool bits of technology. Drones are now coming into schools. That's a big thing in Australia. Uh, 3D printers. Um, so they'll smuggle in this stuff, but it doesn't necessarily stick. The schools are a huge mixed economy in terms of the technology that's there, in terms of everything. The apps that are being used, the devices that are there. You know, Not all the tech that's coming in is particularly good. Um, as I say, the, I'm really interested in this idea of the platform society. Jose van Dyke talks about the platform society, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Definitely in the schools we're in, that's the case. But also this platform, the LMS, the learning management system as a platform, I think we really need to get to grips with that. There's no point developing the 101st cool app on the app Google Apple Store. I think we really need to think about learning management systems. And I can talk a bit about the ones that they were using, because it was interesting. It was a local one. It was a made in Melbourne learning management system. The teachers and... and I've de delineated it. Teachers and teaching and teachers and the work that teachers do. I think fr from a teaching point of view, these are n most of the teachers we've seen are not passionate Vygotskians that are desperate to smuggle in the latest social cultural learning. They're not, you know, they're principal pragmatists. They want to get stuff done. They want to do right by their kids and they want to make sure that everything goes smoothly. They don't want additional problems. Um, they see the need to tick the technology box. They don't necessarily see the need to uh, use the all of the latest stuff. They can sniff out, um, I've written down bullshit, but I'm not sure that's the right word. They can sniff out the rubbish, or the hype. They're not stupid, um, which I'm not saying we assume they're stupid, but there is a sense that 
you make it shiny and they'll come. But what's more interesting is that a lot of the ways that teachers are engaging with technology is as workers, as teaching as labor, not teaching as learning. So that's a really interesting thing to think about. A lot of our work has looked at how teachers' work is increasingly coded and prescribed through software. A lot of it's template teaching, filling in templates through learning, and that's a fascinating change. The intensification of work through technology. The teacher that's nine o'clock watching his kids do homework is working. He doesn't see it as work. So many teachers battling with email, you know, filling in e clearing email boxes on a Sunday evening. If you're clearing your email box on a Sunday evening, you are working. You're not preparing for work. And so this idea of uh, with all the digital labor scholars that talk about um, hidden labor, it's writ large in teachers. It's, it's really, really interesting. And the stuff that suddenly becomes non-work, so a lot of the effective work, dealing with student emails on a Sunday night, dealing with crises, getting students to engage all the time, all that effective work or emotional labor is suddenly pushed away from teachers as, as work, which is really, really interesting. And then lastly, schools. And again, I've delineated this, and these might not work particularly well, but the school as a place, as a physical location, as a site, is really, really important. School buildings are not necessarily set up very well for tech. School PowerPoints are not, uh, not very well set up for tech. The physical infrastructure of desks and rooms and all that stuff is really, really interesting. So those power wars, those, those power socket wars are really interesting, I think. Maybe in 10 years' time it won't be an issue. We'll have somehow solved the power, but there'll be something else like that that schools will be struggling with and trying to regulate technology use through the physical or the digital infrastructures. Um, and of course, I think the, the infrastructure is a really interesting thing. These are creaking networks. These are creaking schools. And the tech one of the schools had a two-day blackout where the, the internet just didn't work. And it was really interesting what happened then. But that's going to happen more and more. Um, so we need to get onto that. But also schools as organizations. We like to think that schools are quite responsive. But schools are big, large public institutions that act as such. I mean, um, people like Goffman or Foucault would talk about hospitals, prisons, and schools. In some ways, schools are still like that. They're, they're kind of not very, they're like super tankers. They don't change very quickly. They're very bureaucratic organizations. They're very complex organizations, but they have to be. I mean, they're trying to do really complex stuff. So working with schools, it's really difficult to think, yep, we're going to smash reform schools or schools are all this rubbish. It's not happening like that. These are not broken institutions either. School is not broken by any stretch of the imagination. So that discourse isn't coming out of our data at all. They do what they expect to do, what you'd expect them to do. They're trying to get on and get by. What was interesting is that schools are not necessarily a place of great leadership of technology. There were policies put in place and technology was being procured, but there wasn't great leadership. Stuff was interesting, innovative stuff was taking place in it, but individual s departments or individual teachers, but it wasn't being leveraged or scaled up. Most people didn't know what everyone else was doing. And a lot of people were quite reluctant to tell everyone what they were doing. As a teacher, I don't necessarily want to show you my lessons online in case it comes back to bite me. Um, so that's that. And then last of all, school as an activity or as a purpose. And I think this is the key thing. And I, I hinted before at the Cuban idea of the grammar of schooling. Time, assessment, knowledge, places, spaces. The grammar of schooling is still writ large. This is why iPads are so successful, because you can use them like a book. This is like interactive whiteboards were so successful, because you can use them like a chalkboard. There was a lot of that. But I don't think it's as simple as computers meet in classroom, classroom wins. The grammar of schooling was there, but the one of the things that was overriding all three schools we worked in were these wider logics of schooling. So they were the, must be the same in the States. In our schools, it was engagement. Anything you talked about, people would say, oh yeah, this is gonna cause, this is gonna increase engagement. Engagement was the watchword. Evidence is another one. Um, in Britain at the moment, it's resilience. But there are these big kind of meta logics which are being pushed onto schools by state government, federal government, assessment authorities. And this is what technology is filtered through. The, the 3D printers were bought by the schools and the woodwork department convinced the teachers to do this by saying, this is going to increase engagement. So all of a sudden, it just became this engagement machine. <laughs> and these are the things that shape the ways that technologies are used and the way that they're maybe reproducing ways of doing education. So I've got two minutes left. I was going to finish with the money shot, so um, this is hopefully what we could talk about. I'm, I don't know what you're interested in talking about. There's a whole bunch of stuff about making a difference and helping kids that were perhaps less uh, advantaged and gender and social, cla social class in particular is something that we're really interested in unpacking. The hidden injuries of class, if you're bringing in a, a, an iPhone 6 or you're bringing in a crappy cracked Chinese uh, 
Android ripoff. Really interesting. There is stuff you could say about developing new technologies if you're interested. I think I've worked out how you can make a million dollars, and it doesn't involve building apps at all. Don't build any more apps. If you are building apps and you're sticking analytics in them as well, be warned, they will be used for bad. And, and anyway, maybe the learning management system in earbuds are an interesting way of uh, looking at things. If I had a million dollars, though, I'd be developing new school practices. I wouldn't be developing new technologies at all. I think we need decent pedagogies that work. Bring your own device pedagogies that really work, not ones that we wish that teachers would do. But if I'm a teacher with 30 devices in a room, what on earth do I do? If I'm trying to get 3D printing to work with a group of 30 kids, how on earth can I make that practically work? Secondly, I think there's something about working out ways of getting teachers to really share practices with each other and open up and not feel like anything they put up is then going to be used as uh, evidence of their effectiveness or their performance, because that's performativity comes into this a lot. And lastly, decent models of leadership as well, because this is a big leadership black hole, I think, in schools. And last of all, this idea of make it I connected. I, I, I think I know what connected learning is. I've read all the MacArthur literature. I've done, I still couldn't really make it fit with the schools. And we tried talking to teachers about this, and they were just like, oh, that's just nonsense. I think it's, and we, we need to have a discussion about what we think connected learning is, and any cool innovation in technology, actually. And if so, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to sell? Is it learning? Is it technology? Is it actually a new structure of schooling? Is it de-schooling? And be very clear about the values that are implicit in that, but also where that might, those values might rub up against and bump up against existing values, and where they might actually find a space around the edge to work. And I think there's three ways of trying to change schools. You either work with them, which I'm not sure connected learning is trying to do. You either work against them, which is possibly what connected learning is trying to do, or you try and, as I say, work around the edges and let stuff seep in, which is possibly the the most productive way of doing stuff. So I mean, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to change schools or are we just trying to kind of tinker with things around the edges? And then lastly, my own agenda is that I, the difference between me, I think, and the connected learning people is I'm not interested in learning. And as I say, we didn't see a huge amount of learning necessarily take place. And if we did, it's very difficult to explain it. It's all the stuff around the edges. So I'm much more interested in getting publics involved in making this more of a site of controversy I think a lot of these things are, are quite, not scandalous, but there's the conversations we need to have. There was a big push in the UK about five years ago about the, the, the crappy nature of school meals, school food, and everyone got really dis oh, this week, How can we give to kids substandard food? I'd love to see the same sort of thing take place with technology and have a real sort of debate. I want students, teachers, parents, community leaders, employers, everyone, just have a say in this. Because at the moment, this stuff's just sort of taking place under the radar, and as long as the boxes are getting ticks, everybody's happy. But I think there's a lot more work we could do in terms of making it more messy and having discussions which are a bit more messy as well. So that's me done, I think. Um, I hope that made sense. Thank you so much, Neil. And we have time for questions. Yes. Or a discussion, honestly. Yes, I'd love discussion. to, because you've got okay. policy makers, designers. There must be some of these things that are really burning you as well. Yeah, I mean, were there specific questions that you'd like us Anything to Anything you're interested with? in. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Thank you so much, Neil. This was fascinating. And I think there are a lot of pieces of this that seem to resonate with what's happening here in the US as well. Um, my question, uh, and I have many that I want to ask, but um, I guess the first one is just relating to your understanding of kind of the adoption, um, specifically of apps. I'm, I'm really interested in kind of what the pressures were either on teachers or if it was, um, if the motivation was coming from the teachers themselves and um, what their perception was of the benefits of using these tools in the classroom? Because you mentioned a few of those, and I wondered if you Yeah, I mean, most of the app um, adoption was completely bottom-up. So as far as the schools are concerned, the learning management system, everything is done through the learning management system. You can upload content, you can communicate, you can do analytics, you can provide evidence of your work. It can all be done through that, and it should all be done through that. Everything is done through that. Even if a kid doesn't turn up for a lesson, they have to go into the learning management system, download a code, give the code, and it's just all... So the schools don't want anything more than that. The app adoption tended to be teachers that wanted to do a little bit extra. So the polling apps, polling, 
polling. I don't know how you say it in the States, but if I wanted to find out how many of you were... Black. So these polling apps were very useful because they allowed teachers to do it. So they'd do that, and they'd say to the kids, right, I want you all to download this app or have this plug in, and this is what we'll do for my lesson. Now, the trouble is that if the math teacher was doing that with uh, Quizlet and then the English teacher was doing it with Poll Anywhere, the core kids are just... Oh, bloody hell. So a lot of it was just bottom-up. There was a bit of sharing around. Um, so the schoolology, um, uh, in one of the schools, the learning management system was particularly clunky. So a few of the teachers would use these other apps and club together. But it was very much around the teacher finding something that would scratch an itch or tick a box or fulfill a need, using it. But their motivations was very much around this idea of standardization and control and regulation. Ideally, they'd let the kids go on the app store and say, knock yourselves out, find whatever you want that, ever that allows you to do this and just do it any way you want. But it was never like that. It was always one app for one purpose, in what used in one way. And I don't see how it would be any other way, really, unless we change wider things, because the teachers are all trying to do the same thing to get the kids to do the same thing. Yeah, so that's something to think about in terms of when you're... And the other thing about developing apps as well, it's great to chuck everything in. So a lot of these apps had communication with students, had analytics, had content... They're all basically learning management systems, just in a kind of different form. And that became really tricky because they were all... So I, if I was going to build an app, I'd build it very, very specifically and think only what I was trying to get it to do, not just chucking in everything else as well. If you put analytics into an app, the analytics will be used for auditing, accountability, and control of what kids do. So don't stick it in unless you have to. I'm interested in sort of the opposite of adoption of new things and kind of the tail end of like when technologies become moribund or obsolete. And did you see any sort of practices or policies that try to address that? I'm just thinking of like, even when I was teaching at the university level, like the course management software we were using is now going out of business and now we have to get everything off. And a lot of these like hot apps are like hot one day and then they're just gone the other. So how do these schools deal with that? Well, the fascinating thing about all these schools is that the Victorian state government, the states and federal government, the Victorian state government had introduced a statewide internet, basically. They'd invented their own internet called Ultranet. It was a system that every school would use. It, it was quite a crazy idea. Um, would have been great if it worked. It was seen to be an absolute disaster. So this system was introduced. All the schools had to buy into it, and they'd all bought the kit, and then the funding was pulled. So there was a complete policy vacuum. So all of these schools were acting in the aftermath of this state government disaster. This isn't being recorded, is it? No, I think it, no, 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 it, it's widely uh, acknowledged as a disaster. And so the, the learning management system which these three schools were using was locally produced by a Melbourne company, and it was used in about 200 high schools in, in the state, and it was touted as the thing that Ultranet should have been. And so the trouble was that all the schools were scrabbling around on their own to try and kind of work in this vacuum, whereas previously they'd been kind of told what they had to do. And that's why you got this variety of practice. It's a very laissez-faire approach, and good schools are doing good things. But on the other hand, mediocre schools are doing mediocre things. And I would argue there's, a, there's a definitely a space there for more government intervention and intervention from other kind of uh, public groups. So, yeah, the, the, I'm quite interested in the, the ghosts of technology. So this like, remediation advice that old technologies live on in new technologies, which I'm sure you know, most of you work on yourself. Yes, yeah, so the ghost of Ultranet was very much apparent in the way that technologies were being used. And that legacy is always there. And so the other thing is they had a big netbook, netbook program in the early 2010s. And that legacy was still, I think, influencing how the bring your own device policies were being used. They were thinking it very much as a netbook program, even though they were allowing kids to bring in anything they wanted. So again, these are not uh, explicit rules and regulations, but they're kind of implicit understandings and meanings that, that carry on. So yeah, the next big thing is never just a new big thing. It's half of the stuff that went before. And that's something to bear in mind as well. Where are you treading that has been trodden before? So picking up on those two about teacher stress and antiquated technologies, do you feel that there's always been this pressure uh, financially on educational systems and on teacher training time to have the newest technology. So there were computers, spend millions of dollars on computers and train teachers. And then, oh, computers with CD-ROMs and multimedia, and do it again. And oh, the internet, and do it again. And tablets, and do it again. 
yeah, because there just seems to be the stress for the new, the new, the new, and maybe we should be spending money on, say, keeping the buildings in one piece mm. and maybe, you know, not having electrical outlets in the ceiling um, and teacher training on more basic teacher training things and not having them, like you mentioned, like checking their email and emptying their email inbox on a Sunday night. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's really important questions. Um, the teachers, I was re I'm a cynical old sod at the best of times. The teachers are far less cynical than... I would hope they would have been. There wasn't this resistance and just, oh, yeah, we've seen it a hundred times before. Teachers would say, we've seen this a hundred times before, but they just get on with it. That was actually quite a positive attitude. I guess you've got so much reinvention coming at you in every aspect of your work. Technology is just another thing. So I guess that's another important thing to think about. This isn't the only innovation or change or you know, thing that teachers are being asked to deal with. In terms of the, the curriculum, the assessment policies, the way that school teachers are bombarded with change and they just deal with it, they go with the flow, which is why a lot of maybe interesting stuff gets just washed away because flotsam and jetsam. So the teachers weren't resistant against the technology, they weren't over technology, they could see that technology was useful and where it was helping them, they wouldn't uh, take it, they wouldn't uh, necessarily kind of reject it. The teachers stress things interesting, teachers are stressed, teachers are overworked and that's got not not necessarily caused by the technology. It's definitely amplified by the technology. So we were interested in, in how email was used in each of the schools. And so they were kind of bullying <laughs> examples. There were certainly some very kind of top-down regressive uses of emailing. Um, but they m tended to mirror the relationships that teachers had anyway with school leaders and each other. So if you're being rude to a colleague on email, your chances are you're generally rude to them anyway. It was interesting, I was quite interested in this area of people being curt and um, how email was being used to depersonalize and dehumanize relations. There was a tendency actually with email for people to be a little bit blunter than they normally were and a bit offhand. But it wasn't necessarily a new thing, it was kind of amplifying stuff that had taken place before. So yes, teachers were stressed and overworked. Technology was seen to be a way to allow them to be stressed and to overworked. And so actually quite a lot of teachers welcomed it as helping them overwork. Now, the root cause of that problem is they should be pushing back about being overworked. Um, but they were saying, technology is great. It allows me to do so much more in a short period of time. And I'm doing so much more and I'm you know, getting... No one said it's given me loads of free time and I'm much less stressed and I have weekends free. It just allowed them to fill up their time more efficiently. So I think there's a wider issue there about overwork and teacher and you know, all that stuff that isn't necessarily a tech conversation. But tech is a really interesting prism through which to view all these issues. That's half, half the battle. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm thinking about the findings that you presented um, about the teachers and, and the sort of the expectation that their uh, technology would allow for um, some creative spaces, some creative work, but that there were instead these sort of spaces of regulation. The teachers were taking on this regulation role. Um, and then your findings about... Um, thinking about schools and uh, the infrastructure and all of the ways um, that uh, these uh, technologies sort of not able to fulfill this uh, liberatory uh, kind of goal, I guess. And, and I'm thinking about your so what slide and I'm wondering if we can think about your research actually providing um, providing a way for us to actually interrogate our um, beliefs, our sort of cultural beliefs, I'm a cultural anthropologist, our cultural beliefs in the liberatory nature of technology, right? And, and I know here, even in this organization, there have been talks about how, uh, you know, there are various technologies, surveillance technologies that we assume will offer us these liberatory um, mechanisms that they that these are sort of uh, inherent in technology that maybe these findings actually provide a, a way for us to turn that around and say that you know maybe it's not the teachers and I know that, that you're not blaming the teachers right but to say that maybe it's not the teachers maybe it's not the schools and their failing infrastructure but maybe it is this a way for us to stop and sort of interrogate this idea that we come into it that te technology is going to sort of inherently um, create maker spaces create flexibility create innovation. Absolutely. No, that's the, that's the key, I think. Hopefully, you did, did you record that? I want to uh, <laughs> write that down. No, absolutely. And you're, there's so much to unpack there. What I wanted to say in the last that slide there is I really think we need to think about the values behind people that are getting involved in technology, particularly from outside of education. Not to say that people in education are perfect and know everything. Clearly, they don't. But yeah, 
we need to ch check our own sort of uh, ideas and why we're getting involved in this. When I talk about discipline and regulation, I don't necessarily mean them in a bad way. Schools are about regulation and discipline and sorting. And that's what we had a fascinating set of conversation with the school leaders. And we said, oh, what about monitoring and technology? And the one of the principals said, look, you're using monitoring in a really bad way. You think that's a terrible thing, don't you? For me, monitoring is like being a doctor. I monitor a patient, and if there's something I can... And that's how they see monitoring and um, surveillance. R so, yeah, we come at it with a set of kind of um, preconceived uh, values. And th the liberatory, liberatory thing, I think, is a really, really interesting thing to unpack. I don't think necessarily that... Um, a lot of those values are necessarily driven from an educational point of view. I think there's a lot of, um, not anti-education, but people want to change what they see as a fundamentally broken system. The idea of teacher-proofing, for example, or the idea of alter alternative ways of schooling. I would much rather look towards something like Quest to Play, which is not necessarily based around tech. It's just a based around a different way of thinking about relationships and learning and curriculum than a school which is all about you know the Steve Jobs iPad schools for example so yeah yeah what is it that we think we want to be doing and why do we think uh, what's liber liberatory, liberatory about uh, technology and those values I don't think fit very well with education I was talking to a, an academic from Europe who's worked with DML and I said what is connect well, actually it was one of my colleagues said to him what is to connected learning and he said it's just Silicon Valley bullshit about schools about people who don't understand don't understand schools and he'd got money from MacArthur so he kind of knew what it was and there is that perception out there that a lot of people like the MacArthur lot, the DML lot, the connected learning lot, a lot of these think tanks are a bit utopian. They're a bit kind of, and the Silicon Valley brush is something that kind of tars you a lot as well because you'll seem to be these solutionists that think technology for good or apps for good. And schools aren't necessarily against that. They just see that as just nonsense and just ignore it. So that's what I mean about thinking about here. If we really want to reform schools or have a new way of learning, then that's what you want to do. That's different from getting technology into schools. Because getting technology into schools isn't going to do that. It isn't going to empower previously disempowered people. There's more to do. So I think in terms of helping kids who are disengaged or disadvantaged, I would definitely be, first of all, giving stuff away to them. The only way bring your own device can work is if you actually give people devices. Allowing them to purchase them or lease them or having this mixed economy just doesn't work at all. And secondly, spend money on decent teachers. Spend money on getting decent curriculum resources. Spend effort making curricula more interesting. So the non-tech stuff is where I'd be investing money if I wanted to actually help people. Um, so I'm, thank you so much. I think part of what I found so interesting is that you're living very much within the schools and within the communities. Absolutely. I'm living at the 30,000 foot pace. Mm. And one of the things that's been intriguing to me has been living with the rollout of tech in education. At the same time, I'm thinking about the rollout of tech in criminal justice. And one of the reasons I think that that's, it's been an interesting move to go back and forth between them is the cultural logics that operate in those two domains of what we think the tech is doing. What we think the tech is doing in uh, criminal justice is empowering a whole set of actors, namely like the police. And more often than not, what we think of in education at a cultural level is about replacement. And my you know, immediate jump to that is to say that this is a gendered conversation, mm -hmm. right? That when we are dealing with gendered masculine spaces, we talk about empowerment. When we're dealing with gendered feminine spaces, we talk about replacement. And I think that that's an intriguing move as we're seeing it. So I think about your last, the answers to your last two questions. And one of the things, you're living in the ground and you're seeing what can happen within the schools, and yet many of the things you keep moving to are more the policy area and challenges there. And so for me, I really love the fact that your teachers are just happy um, and in the face of a lot of adversity because like, what they're really grappling with is a level of politics and economic redistribution that is far beyond their control, right? And fundamentally, what's at stake in a lot of these tech environments is that it's about taking money from local communities and shoring up a lot of businesses and vendors. And we quickly go to Silicon Valley, but actually most of these are not Silicon Valley. Most of these are a whole set of secondary groups whose entire economic structure is about selling to schools and selling to governments, um, which means that there's a whole different kind of resistance. And so part of what I'm trying to think through is how do we understand the different actors that your work can have us interact with and the different moves of change. And so when I hear you talk about the teachers, for me, the move of change there is how to get them 
shore it up to just roll with whatever is thrown at them because they're not going to be able to do this fight, not on top of their day job. Mm. And then the other question is, how do you build a meaningful coalition of people who can shore up a fight for the broader political and economic conditions that are at stake in all of this? Because that, to me, is actually really divorced from what's going on on the ground. And so I don't see moving teachers as a way to actually challenge it. I see moving teachers as a way to stand strong in light of a lot of bullshit that's gonna keep coming their way. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out like, how do we think about those different actors and where are the different pushes that can happen there? No, absolutely. Um, are we allowed to talk about Pearson or companies like that here? You're right, a lot of the actors are not Silicon Valley, they're a big, publishing companies, there are big transnational corporations that are making a lot of money advising federal state government and actually taking over schools. Um, one of our schools was a Google school or was previously been a Google school and there's this whole, it really interesting, this kind of alternate governance structure which is coming from big companies and EdTech is full of that. Um, the cultural logics of education, I think, are very. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's all neoliberal, the corporate reform of schools. This idea of GERM, the global education reform movement, the idea of accountability and performativity and all of that stuff is writ large in the way that text is being implemented in schools. I think it's great that most teachers are actually, as you say, resilient enough to just go with the flow now. I wonder if that's a self selecting thing, that these are the ones left that have got the kind of resilience to kind of deal with this crap. Um, but they're, they're quite happily chugging along, and I think you're right. Change, if change is going to come, needs to come from elsewhere. And this is kind of what my last slide is about, widening the publics of education technology. There are many publics of education who are not interested or not necessarily involved. So unions, labor unions, I think, have got a much bigger role to play in this. If the school tweaks the learning management system by about 1%, you can have a huge effect on the working conditions of teachers. But the union wouldn't necessarily push back on that as they would if they were going to reduce the expenditure on textbooks, for example. So I think teaching unions might be one space there. Um, but we need a whole kind of alt education space that's not necessarily tech driven or driven by Pearson or driven by app developers, but is driven by these kind of community groups that I think have always been involved in schools. Um, so again, you know. Um, not necessarily going down the kind of progressive education, alternative education, de-schooling routes, because those groups have got some kind of play in this debate. But getting kind of the, usual, the, pe the teachers that aren't interested in technology, because the teachers that tend to have voices in this space are the usual enthusiasts who are men with beards no normally. Um, so we want teachers who are necessarily interested in tech. They're disinterested. They're not uninterested, but they're just disinterested. And same with students as well, student voice. Um, and we um, can say that's a very blithe thing to say. Community groups, local employers, there's a whole bunch of publics I think that we need to get engaged. Um, I haven't got the answers to that though, so. Um, yeah, thanks Neil. And I guess kind of building on the last couple of questions, um, curious about some of your thoughts on developing new school practices. And just to throw out a couple of examples, you know, we've kind of touched on. One is, you know, the LMS, like you say, is it sort of reflects a fairly brittle, uh, old legacy system of the industrial model. Mm. And so we tweak it around the edges, but it only changes so much. Um, and, you know, just to throw out one of these kind of buzzwords, fashionable, the idea of a flipped classroom so that kids could go at their own pace. Maybe it's in, in elsewhere in the classroom or at home. And that um, there'd be organizational change to support different teaching methodologies with teams supporting to get that one-on-one -on -one experience. And, um, you know, that may require, like you say, uh, unions supporting it, organizational change, physical change in the way classrooms are laid out, and the extent to which technology is almost the last thing mm. to put into the equation. You know, do you, do you see evidence that some of those, so some of those other changes uh, could make a difference um, in some way. No, again, a really interesting set of points. I would love to see a genuinely educationally developed LMS developed by educators. Because you, as you say, it's a corporate, as, as a lot of applications and software is that's used in schools, it's a business thing. Content management systems hitting schools. So the legacy of the intranet is still there. So a genuinely educationally developed by teachers and students, LMS would be perfect. Um, the flipped thing's interesting. We, we've talked with all of our schools about these things and these buzzwords. Maker, 
none of the teachers actually had heard of maker culture or makers. They couldn't care less about that. It was a 3D printer. Flipped hadn't really hit and people didn't really understand what it was. It's really interesting to see how flipped has hit higher education though. So I, I teach flipped now or flexible learning as it's called in my university. And it's really interesting to see how that has been taken by the university machine and basically turned into video lectures that you watch before the, lec the, the seminar and then you get uh, a grad student or an adjunct student to actually teach the, 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 the seminar session interaction. And it's getting flipped to the kind of logics of the higher education system that we can now have product that's delivered more cheaply. Um, where it's worked well though, you're right, flipped is seen as a philosophy, not a tech solution. So people have talked about, all right, preload stuff with you know, homework as such or preparation work and how do we actually get discussions going? And then very quickly we found in university that you can't get a discussion going with a tiered lecture theatre because people can't turn around and talk to each other. So we've, talk, we've had to redesign spaces and rooms. Universities now are, are investing in TV studios and high, how do you produce a high quality video or a podcast? Because most of them are quite crappy. So all of that stuff has to get rid and then Flipped is working. But generally Flipped has become this way of just making kids watch videos on uh, Moodle and then turn up and have a discussion that's not particularly, th and that's not really good learning either, is it? Now that's not hit schools. Flipped in schools, I think the philosophy and the logic of flipped is so f miles away from what schools are all about. It would take a huge kind of uh, curriculum change, first of all. The one interesting thing in, in Australian schools, which will make tech suddenly a lot more important, is that the national examinations are going online for 2018. And that's pushing a lot of change because, God, if the examinations are online, we've got to make sure we get the tech right. So those are the big kind of movers and, and levers. Um, but yeah, you're right. Making people think about things like flipped or even things like maker culture is not a tech, not a, it's not about the technology. Get everything else right and then get the technology in where, when and where it may, might make a difference. Um. Thanks so much for the presentation. I, I want to make a plea for the importance of data gathering like yours that is humanistic and um, qualitative because one of the issues with the with ed tech being controlled by outside vendors is that they also control the terms of the debate. They decide what efficacy is. Pearson has a very large efficacy practice dedicated to demonstrating that the technologies that they produce and sell to schools produce improved outcomes on the tests that they produce and sell to schools. Yeah. Um, so it's end to end. And uh, without real information about how technology is distancing students from teachers and decreasing their engagement in the classroom and decreasing active learning, um, we can't really start to have a debate about what, we, what the true role of technology in schools ought to be or is. Um, I think people agree on these non you know, non-standardized test outcomes that they're important, um, but they don't have good measurements of them and good observations about them. And in the absence of those, um, tech will drive uh, will drive the conversation toward predetermined outcomes and measures. Mm. Uh, and if I can make one plea to anyone who's a research funder, is just fund research, which isn't just looking for the answer. The research in this area is fascinating because people, a lot of people are in, in education technology because they want to make a difference. They want to make a positive change. No one just wants to use technology and makes things worse. So there's very much a kind of confirmatory approach to working with ed tech. And the research that uh, goes along with it, I wouldn't even say it was research. It was more evidence, evidence in a legalistic sense of gathering stuff that supports your case rather than evidence in a kind of more anthropological sense. The trouble is with the research that we do, most people, most people know this, most people are not stupid. They roll their eyes and go, yeah, yeah, we know that tech's not brilliant in schools, but what could happen, what should happen? So ed tech research is always looking for potential. To do research on what is happening isn't really interesting. Even the schools actually are not that, in we're really interested in how schools use data. And a lot of them have said, we don't want data that's told us what's going on at the moment or what's happened. We can't do anything about that. We want to know what's going to happen in the future. Where are the bumps in the road? What's the intel? Which is a really interesting way of thinking about things. We're there to try and make a difference to this fu these future life chances of these kids. Don't tell us about the last trends over the last 20 years. Now, to me, the trends over the last 20 years are far more interesting because they'll tell you, in a way, what's going to probably happen. So the ed tech research mentality is very much around either case studies of sexy stuff, best practice, Evidence gathering to say yes, this pr and no academic researcher worth their soul will say yes, technology leads to X percent gains in learning, but yet that's what people want. So it's a real minefield. At the moment, we can get our kind of research funded by government, but that's becoming less and less, um, we're less and less able to do that. We had a really interesting project on data and schools that, that got knocked back because we were looking at the messy nature of data. No one wants to know about that. Our next 
research project will probably build an app that will solve the problems of data and you know all that because that's how you get research funded these days. So it's a real pressure. So I'm, I'm hoping people like your research, your think tank, Data and Society, and other things around that should be able to do this more interesting, gritty type of research because it's actually much more useful for schools, for teachers, for policymakers. But it never gets funded. So yeah. We have one more question. Hi. In higher ed, we're being bombarded by publishers really selling us their content management systems, just like Anya was saying. And there's very little data to show that they have direct relation to student learning outcomes that are not generated by those same publishers. Yeah. And a colleague and I have been <laughs> investigating this. And so far, we, we've done tests in the classroom, and, and there's, there's no significant difference on final exam scores between a fancy adaptive learning technology program versus just good old fashioned static quizzing. Mm. Uh, but according to all of the publishing companies I speak with, at least for higher ed, the move is that in five years we will no longer have textbooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one would think it might convey the advantage that it, w it will allow instructors to semi customize classwork, but then we're being handicapped to some degree by being limited to what they're offering. And I'm certain this is going to affect K through 12 as well. So I was curious about your thoughts on that topic. Oh, I mean, the no significant difference phenomenon phenomena is well noted in all <laughs> innovation in education. That's kind of what it is. And I think people only want to say it, it's causing a positive difference in order to be able to sell something. I mean, most people assume that it's kind of no significant difference. So I think there's so many pressures here. And of course, we won't have textbooks in higher education in 10 years' time. But that's going to be a supply side thing rather than a demand side thing, isn't it? And it's just to save costs and whatever else. So again, it's these kind of wider logics of efficiency and you know, a bit more business-like ways of working in education sold to edu educators and students as more convenient, perhaps. I wouldn't say it's necessarily more effective. And so my real worry is, and this is going a bit slightly off topic, that you're going to have a two-tier system of elite education that has textbooks and real-life teachers and a nice, you know, everyone wears mortarboards like Harry Potter. And then you'll have this big mass delivery system that's much more based around technology that's much more about content, content kind of throwing out and, you know, diploma mills. Um, so, yeah, particularly in higher education, but also in schools, because you've got the growth of online schooling now, particularly, obviously, in the States, but it's coming to other places as well. You are definitely going to have these, and you see these very alarmist stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about, oh, you know, the, the Silicon Valley um, businessmen send their kids to schools with no technology because they just want in how, how hypocritical they are. And in a way, that's very alarmist and reductionist, but you can kind of see it happening, that the unique selling point of a private school will be we don't do it the way that they're doing it in the in the real world, which is a real danger. So, yeah, not sure what we can do in higher education about it, though, because it's, um, it's a big machine. That was a depressing note to end on, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yay, yay, connected learning. Sorry. Thank you so much, Neil. And, oh, thank and you. you did challenge us before the, 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 the last statement to consider... Uh, ways we can be pursuing um, research and data. But and can we just be positive? I am positive. I'm not cynical. I'm skeptical, but I'm not cynical. And I think, you know, we can be, there can be negativity in all of this without being kind of really just hopeless. So I, I, would, I do want to end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and thank, thank you. you for your excellent questions. Yeah,